Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to give, Lord, to your work here in Hamilton and around the world. We pray that you would use our offerings, Lord, to bless our missionaries in Cuba and Indonesia and Vanuatu. We pray that you would use our offerings, Lord, to bless your people here in Hamilton and also to enable us, Lord, to become uh, an, a, a church that, that reaches out to the community, Lord. Help us to reach out uh, in all these different ways, Lord. We pray for uh, the Working Bee Ministry, that that would continue and increase. We also pray for our evangelism, Lord, to happen uh, more frequently. And um, yeah, we do pray, Lord God, that you would bless our church, Lord, to be uh, a, a church that reaches out to you reaches out to the community, and we do commit all these offerings that we've brought to you today, and uh, we commit them into your hand, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, please turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 2. So last week we... Uh, <coughs> Consider what it meant for what it means for God to have separated light from darkness as we looked at Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 to 5 and Specifically we talked about how light and darkness are separated throughout the Bible Especially in moral terms the darkness and the light and that God has called us out of darkness moral darkness depravity into his marvelous light and he's the one who said let light shine out of darkness. He is the one who has shone in our hearts the light of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And so now as Christians, we are to walk in the light, separated from the darkness. And we are to let our light shine before men so that they'll see our good works and glorify our Father who's in heaven. So that was uh, last week's meditation. Today we're going back into Matthew, looking at chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. So I will read that for us. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Amen. This is a well-known story because we talk about it each Christmas. But I wonder if when you look at this story, do you get a little anxious when you read through it? Does it bother you that the Bible makes such a big deal about this special star that led the wise men? The one that shone brightly, it brought the wise men from the east, it stopped over Bethlehem and pointed out the Messiah. I wonder, does it worry you that the Bible perhaps isn't aligned with our best understanding of modern science and what we know about astronomy? 
And uh, some people might even say it's reading like a fairy story here. Has that thought ever crossed your mind? Because it's definitely crossed the minds of your unbelieving friends and family members. So what are we to make of this event in Matthew chapter 2? In the early life of Jesus here on earth. Who were these strange men? These, these magi. Magoi in Greek. Magicians. And what, uh, what was it that they saw that brought them on this epic journey from Babylon all the way to Israel just to see a child? So let's think about those magi first of all. In Greek, magoi, they are the priestly caste, the with quite well known within the Medes and Persian culture. Biblically speaking, when did we last see them in the Bible? When did we last see wise men in Babylon? It was in the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And uh, these, these events here in Matthew 2 are taking place around 500 years after the book of Daniel, the events of the book of Daniel. But it's interesting to think about the possible links with that great prophet. So we see when in, in, early in Daniel, the book of Daniel, they're mentioned as magicians or enchanters. But it also included men who were wise or learned, those who understood the natural order. We might call them scientists. And particularly those who understood the movements of the stars and had records of them. We would call them astronomers today. And of course, we know that the Within the ancient world, there were many religious practices connected with the movement of the stars. You think about Egypt and the, the pyramids and the Stonehenge in England, all these different ancient religions which were centered around the movements of the stars. Nowadays, if, we, if I was to talk to you about the stars, you might assume that I'm talking about astrology, but I'm not. There's a big difference between astrology and astronomy. What's the difference? I think we've lost it in our, in our culture today in a big way. So astrology is, the, is this, it's a speculative practice where you look at the movements of the stars and you say that those movements have something to do with people's life here on earth or that it might affect people's life here on earth. So this is the thought behind those, uh, what you might have seen in the newspaper, those horoscopes where people say, well, you were born in April, so you're your constellation is connected to Aries, and therefore, this week, you're going to meet someone new, and it's, uh, you're going to have a wonderful life, you know, things like that. So that's the kind of fortune-telling-based astrology that we are not talking about when we talk about astronomy. It's very different to what these men, these wise men, were doing. Astronomy is more of an observational science. You look at the stars... And you make records of the various movements of the planets. And this was a very common practice in the ancient world. Because back in those days, of course, people didn't have Netflix. So if you're living in a, in a desert world, a desert uh, land, the, it's been hot all day, burning sun all day. In the cool of the evening, the family would go up and lie down on the flat roof of the house and look out at the stars and talk together. And so people back then had a great familiarity with the movements of the constellations and of the planets was well known. And if you lived in a time uh, without electric light, without light pollution, without any kind of sky pollution actually, and if you lived in a desert-like environment, it would be very normal for you too to have an observational knowledge of the movement of the planets and the movement of the stars. And it's important for us as Christians not to throw out the baby with the bathwater just because there are people who have come up with horoscopes and astrology doesn't mean that we should throw away all, all things astronomical. Because God is the one who created the heavens. He's the one who set them in motion at the time of creation. And they follow that clockwork that he began. In Isaiah 40, he says, Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. So because of God's creation of the stars, and his perfect tuning of the universe, his works are on display here on earth. 
and these stars follow an observational pattern. And thanks to brilliant men and women, mathematicians, and very complex mathematical formulas and modern technology, we can actually model now what the stars and planets are going to do. And that's how, have you ever wondered about that? Like, when it's in the, it's in the newspaper a week before, next week there'll be an eclipse. And if you're in Gisborne, you'll see it better than you will if you're slightly north, right? Because pe through amazing mathematical formulas, people have literally made a model of what the heavens are doing, what the stars and the planets are doing. And that's how they can pinpoint accuracy. With pinpoint accuracy, they can say what's going to happen, what the alignment will be, when there'll be a blood moon. Did anyone else see the blood moon earlier this year? Our family went out. It was about 10 o'clock at night, so a wee bit beyond bedtime, but for a special occasion we went out when we were still in Auckland, actually, to look at the blood moon, the moon turning red. And of course that had been predicted with pinpoint accuracy the previous week in the papers and everything. So there's been amazing advances in technology, and one of those uh, advances is the creation of a computer program that maps out the night sky from any point on the Earth's surface at any time of night or day, going back through the ages, including the time of Christ. Now, I know the Gore family like to sometimes go, is it just Peter that goes and lies on the, on the, um, on the drive, all of you? Okay, so did you go out last night? No, you didn't. Okay, a bit, a bit, bit cloudy last night to go out. But if you had been in Tekofi last night and gone out at 6 p.m., and if, the, uh, if there'd been no light pollution, and if there'd been no other kind of pollution, this is what you would have seen. This is the, the vision of the heavens from last night, 6 p.m., to Kofi. And what's really amazing is that if, if the Gore family had gone out to lie on their drive 800 years ago on August the 20th, this is the night sky they would have seen. Now, isn't that amazing technology that we can pinpoint accurately and precisely what the stars are doing? at any time, at any place. And the great thing about this technology is that people have used it, literally, to find the star of Bethlehem. And it is amazing. So let's go back to those Magi for a second. So Daniel, the prophet, he was brought to Babylon uh, in the captivity, right? The captivity when uh, Israel was taken captive by the Babylonians. So he was brought into this tradition of magi, of, of astro astronomers, of wise men. And he was trained in that tradition. After he'd been trained, he grew to become the most famous and most respected of the magi. And he certainly would have gone on to train magi after him. So there would have been a school of wise men having been trained under Daniel. Now, what do we know about Daniel from the book of Daniel? He was a fantastic prophet. He's quite famous for, he was reading the Bible. He was reading the book of Jeremiah. And he realized while he was reading it, that there was a prophecy there saying that the captivity in Babylon would be ended after 70 years. And so he counted up his time and he realized, we're coming to the end of the captivity, according to God's word, according to this prophecy, according to this word written in advance. We are nearly at the end of this captivity. And so then he begins to pray. He asks God to bring to an end this captivity, something that God has already promised to do. He then begins to pray for the fulfillment of this prophecy. So Daniel's a, fan, a fascinating character. He knew his Bible very well. One wonders how much did he really know about the coming Messiah? And how much did he pass on to those in his school who weren't Jewish, and yet they knew at the time of Christ, 500 years later, they knew enough about the Jewish king that he'd been born, and they came from the East. So this, this is where that theory rises, basically, that Daniel, the prophet, he started a school of wise men in Babylon who were looking at the sky, and they knew enough about Israel and Judah specifically to see a sign in the heavens that the Jewish king had been born and that he was worthy of worship. And when you think about that, that's quite a lot of information to get from the sky. That's quite a lot of information to get from the constellations and the stars. So it leads people to 
the conclusion that there must have been a tradition handed down from Daniel with enough information for people to recognize that the, the tribe of Judah was represented in Jewish thought by a lion. And of course that began with the prophecy of Jacob as he, before he died, he was leaning on his staff, he prophesied over his children. When he spoke about Judah, he said, Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness, who dares rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This is a very well-known prophecy from Judah, from Jacob, about his son Judah, that through his family, through the family of Judah, would come the king, the Messiah, the one who would rule over the nations. Did Daniel, who must have known his Old Testament very well, must have known the book of Genesis, did Daniel pass on this information? Perhaps there was another part of the law from Numbers chapter 24 that Daniel passed on. So in Numbers 24, the prophet Balaam, who again wasn't an Israelite, he was paid money to curse the Israelites because Balak, the, the king, didn't want them to increase in number, didn't want them to be blessed. So he was, he was paid money to curse them. But when he went up to, to pronounce his cursing, instead he, he spoke what God gave him. And in Numbers 24, he said, this is a very interesting prophecy. He said, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. Quite an obscure prophecy, and yet, would Daniel have not known this prophecy very well? Is it possible to think that perhaps Daniel passed down to his school of Magi these prophecies? We already know that he, he loved biblical prophecy and took it very seriously in his own life. So whatever it was that the Magi saw, what they saw in the stars was enough to cause them to make an arduous journey of hundreds of kilometers across desert sands, burning sun, to find the king of the Jews. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they thought, if you look at chapter 2, they thought that Herod should know. They went straight to the palace. Where's the king of the Jews who's been born? Notice they didn't say, was the king of the Jews born? They said, where is he who was born king of the Jews? We saw his star. We've come to worship him. So what was the star that they saw? Okay, so this is a side note to my sermon. Because I spent way too long this week looking at this Stellarium uh, program and finding out what it actually is, verifying it. I, 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 haven't, I wasn't the one who found this. It's been found by other astronomers, experts in the field. But um, maybe we can do it in a Bible study one time. But to be very brief, when you look out at the heavens, there are fixed stars and there are, there are wandering stars. So the fixed stars are the stars that are much further away. They're fixed into constellations. Any time of the year, you can look up, and Orion's belt will have the three stars, right? You see Orion's belt? There he is. So there are certain stars in the, in the field, in our field of vision that are fixed, but there are other stars that move around. They're called wandering stars. And what they are is basically they're planets. So the largest planet in our solar system, any of the kids know what that is, hopefully you do, is Jupiter. So Jupiter is one of the brightest wandering stars or planets that we can look out and find. And at different times of the year, it will be in different places. Jupiter is known as the king's planet. In, the, in ancient history, it was known as the planet of the king because it was the largest, brightest one. So if you are every night going out and lying on your flat roof and watching the stars instead of Netflix, you begin to understand and get a, a feel for where the stars are and you begin to notice where Jupiter is. So Jupiter doesn't move around very quickly but over a period of months you can see it definitely moving, wandering through through the, the field of vision. Basically because of the platform, the viewing platform that we are on, 
and the direction and the orbit of Jupiter. So if you went to Babylon, for example, on September the 12th, 3 BC, what you would see is Jupiter, which is that brightest planet just there, passing by the brightest star, which is called Regulus. Now, if you were a Magi who has been working in the field for 20 years, you've probably already seen this before. It's not anything really special. But if you were to continue to watch Jupiter over the next three months, you'd see something that you had never seen before. And that what it is, was Jupiter went past Regulus, it turned around, because it's a wandering star in the orbits of the, because of the orbits of the planet, it came back and it crowned Regulus again. And then it turned around and it crowned Regulus again. Three conjunctions of the king's star and the king's planet. King, king, king. So that, that's, first of all, that's something that you've never seen before and would be very unusual. You'd definitely make a note of it. Why did the king's planet crown the king's star with a crown three times? By the way, it's within the uh, constellation of Leo, the lion. So that might cause you know, some people to think, oh, like what's happening there? Well, there's a king, there's a, a king, a lion king, the king of the lion. What's going on there? But what really would have made them take a step back was what happened on the morning of September the 14th, sorry, September the 12th, in the year 3 BC. And what happened was in the morning, Following Leo the lion came Virgo, the virgin, because Virgo follows Leo in the constellations. So Virgo, the, the woman who is crowned with 12 stars. And as, as Virgo rose in the morning, the sun rose with Virgo. And so the virgin was, the woman was clothed with the sun as she rose. And at the, fit, at the feet of the virgin, there was a new moon because it was Rosh Shana, it was the Jewish New Year. So you've got, you've got the symbolism of the woman clothed with, clothed with the sun, crowned with 12 stars, with the moon at her feet rising, the morning after the constellation of the, the conjunction of Regulus and Jupiter. So basically there was a lot of symbolism there that would have pointed the Magi to the birth of a king, but it was not enough to make them get up and leave Babylon and go to Israel. That wasn't enough. It looks like this may have been the conception of Christ. This may have been the time when the angel Gabriel came to Mary and told her, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you will be with child. She said, how, how could this be? I, I, I don't know a man. This may have been the day, September 3 BC. But again, it wasn't enough to make them leave Israel, make them leave Babylon, go to Israel. What might have done it is that nine months later, actually nine months and five days later on, they saw another conjunction that they'd never seen before. And that was when Venus, now Venus is another, again, a wandering star, isn't it? The mother planet, Venus was known as. Venus <clears throat> came together with Jupiter, the king's planet, in the closest conjunction that anybody had ever seen before on Earth. And if you're a, a Magi, a wise man looking at these planets, you would have noticed it. Because when Jupiter and Venus came together, they became the brightest object that anybody had ever seen. They became the brightest star. So, like I said, I spent way too long this week on this Stellarium program trying to verify all this information. But watching this heavenly dance of the stars playing out was, was worth it. It's amazing. It's worth a Bible study or two to go through, so hopefully we'll, we'll have time. But ima imagine how amazing it would have been for the wise men to see that star, that bright star, his star, the star of the king, brighter than anything they'd ever seen. It's hard for us to imagine because when we go outside at night time, we've got you know, light pollution. But if all you knew was a dark sky, and the brightness of stars. And then you saw the brightest star you'd ever seen nine months after the crowning of Regulus. Perhaps that's what it was that caused them to make their journey. So if they left Babylon in June and made their several month trip trek across the desert with uh, 
Obviously, they would have had a, a train of camels because they're carrying very precious cargo. There would have been more than three people, for sure. There would have been soldiers and everything. The Magi made their trek across the desert. And this is really a fulfillment of the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verse 3, where we're told that nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. In fact, Isaiah chapter 60 is, uh, has a very strong connection with Matthew chapter 2. So these Magi came to the came looking for the king of the Jews. They came to, naturally came to the palace, but their assumptions about where the king would be had to be corrected by the biblical revelation. So Herod himself asked the scribes, where is the Messiah meant to be born? Where's the Christ to be born? And in Matthew 2 verse 6, the scribes replied with a quotation from two verses from the Old Testament. The first one is Micah 5 2. The second one is 2 Samuel 5 2. They said, You, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who shall shepherd my people Israel. So, Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, Bethlehem, just a few miles south of Jerusalem. That was known to be the place where the Christ would be born. So they took these two wonderful passages that, and brought them together to represent the Messianic hope, the hope that the Messiah, the King, would be born in a small, insignificant town of Bethlehem. And yet he is the one whose origin goes back to ancient times because the Messiah, the King, has eternally existed. So the Messiah would also be the shepherd the one that we've been waiting for, the one who will kindly look after and shepherd his people. It reminds us of those glorious truths that we've been uh, thinking about in, in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Well, the Lord, the eternal God, is born as a baby. He will be the one to shepherd his people. He gives me everything I need. He leads me to green pastures and quiet waters. It also brings to mind the words of Jesus himself, and he said, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. He is our good shepherd who lovingly looks after his people. So the scribes told Herod he's, he'll be in Bethlehem. And then Herod met with the, scribe, with the Magi again, secretly. And what did he want to do? He wanted to find out exactly when the star had appeared. So if the Magi, by now it's December, if they were to, be, if they were to talk about the, cons with the conjunction of Venus and Jupiter, the brightest star, they would have told him six months. But if they were to think back 12 months to more than 12 months, 15 months, to the first appearance of Regulus being crowned by Jupiter, they might have said 15 months. And that time period will become important later on as we read through Matthew chapter 2. So Herod claims that he would also like to go and pay homage to the king of the Jews, this new king of the Jews. Of course, all he wants to do is to destroy that which threatens his own power and authority. And I'm sure that for years afterward, Herod kicked himself for sending the Magi away instead of sending some soldiers with them. But of course, we can acknowledge and recognize God's sovereignty in this matter. It's not to be overlooked. Just like we saw in chapter 1 of Matthew, that all these things took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophets. So the Magi step out of the palace. This is first century Jerusalem. And they look south, directly south to where Bethlehem is. So Bethlehem is direct straight line south of Jerusalem. And what are they looking for that night as they look out? They're looking for the king's star. They're looking for Jupiter again. And what is Jupiter doing at this time in December of 2 BC? By now, Jupiter has arrived in the southern skies. And if you stand at the platform of Jerusalem looking directly south on December the 25th of the second 2 BC, what you'll see is Jupiter, which has been traveling east along the, the line, stops directly south of, of Jerusalem, straight over Bethlehem, and it begins a retrograde motion to go back. And it actually hovers, as it were, 
over Bethlehem if you're standing in Jerusalem. So this may have been the first Christmas, the first Christmas when the wise men, the Magi, brought gifts to Jesus the King, the young Jesus as he was probably less than a year old. <clears throat> now notice what the Magi did when they saw the star. They rejoiced. They started rejoicing. They recognized something of the beauty of God's providence and God's sovereignty in writing out in the stars before time the glory of the birth of the Messiah. There's so much more to this. And uh, from what I've learned about God and his tendency to obscure glory from plain view, when it comes to what was written in the stars about the Messiah, this is really about the fringes of his ways. And uh, there's so much more there to see if you have the tenacity to search for it. God says in Proverbs 25, it is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings to search them out. So all this to show that Jesus is, as we spoke about last week, he is the light of the world. And God shines his bright light to lead his people to Christ. And what is the response of the believing heart? How did they respond? The Magi, when they, when they saw his star, when they went to see the Christ, they were joyfully worshipping the Messiah. Overwhelming joy and then worship. And how much did these Gentile astronomers really know about the God of Israel? Presumably very little. And yet they knew enough to joyfully worship the King, Christ the King. They recognized something about Jesus of Nazareth that we too must recognize, and that is that in Jesus Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, as he says in Colossians 2 verse 3. And notice what the religious leaders did at the time. They were the ones in consternation, rejection, violent rejection of the Messiah. They were the ones who, they could point to the scriptures and say where the Messiah would be, would be born. But they wouldn't take that nine kilometer journey, the five mile journey south to Bethlehem to find him and worship him. So the Magi came to, to Christ the Messiah, they worshipped him and they gave him gifts. Now these specific gifts of frankincense and gold are echoing the words of the prophet from centuries before. Isaiah, again, this is from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 3 to 6. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. <coughs> then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and exult. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense. And shall bring good news. The praises of the Lord. This is 700 years before the Magi made that trip. It's fascinating to think about how this prophecy was fulfilled. Was this prophecy fulfilled through Daniel's own study of the prophecies that he arranged in his school that they would honor the Messiah when he was finally born with such gifts? It's quite mind-blowing to consider the culmination of the ages, the culmination of all prophecy coming together. The very skies and stars are telling the story of the birth of the Messiah. And here come these magi with these gifts of gold and frankincense. And then in verse 12, the Magi, just like Joseph, receive instructions from the Lord in a dream, not to return to Herod. So I'm sure was waiting, I'm sure he was waiting to find out which house is that little king in. They wanted to get rid of him. We'll follow up with that next time. But for today, let's take this away from our, our study of the scripture. Let's joyfully worship the Messiah. He is the one who has his origins in eternity. He is the one who was prophesied in advance. And even the very stars in the sky work together to proclaim the glory of his birth to all nations. He is the one who is our wonderful shepherd who looks after us in his kindness and love. So let's join together 
with those around the world who worship the, the Messiah, the King. Let's join in his, his mission to see himself worshipped here in Hamilton, joyfully, by those around us. So let's proclaim his glory this week, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you glory and honour because you are the King of the universe. You are the Eternal One. You are our Messiah. You are our Christ. You are the Chosen One, the One who was promised. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you condescended to become a man, to take on flesh. You did not consider equality something to be grasped onto. But you emptied yourself and humbled yourself. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have received a name above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father that you are Lord. Jesus, you are our Lord. We thank you for the way that you arranged heaven and earth, Lord, to proclaim your glory. We thank you for those magi from the east. We thank you for their careful observations of the stars. And we thank you for the technology, Lord, that we can look back on now and see your glory playing out in creation. Lord Jesus, help us to worship you. Help us to confidently proclaim your gospel to those around us. When so many in our, in our culture today think of the Bible as nothing more than a fairy story, Lord, let us proclaim the reality of Jesus Christ, you crucified and risen for our sins. Lord, give us confidence and strength. Help us to stand in awe of your glory. Help us to joyfully worship you as those Magi did. We pray all of these things, Lord, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your hymn books to our final hymn, number 35.